Well, this month, we are doing a series called Healthy, Whole, and Holy. Now, a lot of people, a lot of the speakers in different campuses are going to speak about the pragmatics of that, just as we heard on the video about mental health. But I would like to go a little deeper. I'd like to look at the theology of our community. Why is it that we can access health, wholeness, and holiness? So I know you know I'm a teacher and I like to teach, but this is going to be quite solid theology, if that's okay. But I'm going to do my very best to give you access to it, because if we don't get this, we won't get the practicalities and the pragmatics. Is that okay? Just wait for Alan's phone to go off. <laughs> He's a pastor. He knows the rules. <laughs> okay, let's pray. <laughs> Father God, we thank you very much for these wonderful people. Thank you for everybody online. Thank you for everyone in the different campuses who are joining us today. And Father, I thank you for all these people who have gathered together in community this morning. I pray, Father, that you would speak to us through this message. I ask it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Many people suffer from hemophobia, the fear of blood. In my childhood, thankfully, I had no such fear. And uh, the reason that that was good is because I was often covered in blood. Sometimes my own, like when I chopped the top of my finger off, a lot of blood. But usually I was up to my elbows in the blood of animals. In my house, it was my job to gut, skin, and joint the rabbits, the deer, and the pigeons that often ended up on our dinner table. And because I was a biologist, I took great delight in that process and would often dissect all the animals in an outer room before I brought them in to my mother to cook. If you don't like blood, or if you have a fear of blood, you won't like this message. <laughs> Nor, I suspect, will you like the Old Testament, or the book of Hebrews, or the rest of the Bible. <laughs> because the Bible is steeped in blood. But in our modern politically correct world, we rarely talk about the viscerality of the sacrifices in the Old Testament. Blood covenants are central to the biblical narrative. Let me just give you an example. 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 11. I want you to imagine the scene. At that time, they sacrificed to the Lord 700 head of cattle and 7,000 sheep and goats from the plunder they had brought back. They entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, with all their heart and soul. Making a covenant with the sacrifices in the Old Testament, must have been like an abattoir. There's blood everywhere, rivers of blood. What is it about blood that is so important? Palmer, in his book on covenant, says this, a covenant is a bond in blood, sovereignly administered. A bond in blood. He calls it a life and death bond. In our world, we rarely talk about covenants. We talk about agreements, contracts, 
Occasionally, we talk about covenants when it comes to marriage, but we often completely and utterly miss the point. So in order to understand blood covenants, and you'll see where we're going and why this is essential for our health and wholeness, in order to understand blood covenants, we need to go back to the story of Abraham. Abraham was promised not only a child, but he was promised that God would bring him into a promised land. God said to him, look up at the stars. That's how many of your descendants you're going to have. And Abraham, as you can imagine, didn't believe it. So God entered into a covenant with him to prove to him that he would fulfill his promise. He would give him children that would be uncountable and he would bring him into the promised land. And we read about it in Genesis 15 and verse 8. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer and a goat and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. And Abraham brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. So again, imagine the scene. You've got a line of chopped up animals and another line of chopped up animals and a blood-stained passage between the two. Now, the way they made covenants was this. The two parties would walk between the blood-stained animals and agree together that if they failed to keep the covenant, they would end up like the animals. This is a serious covenant. You better be faithful or blood will be shed. That's the nature of the covenant. But this is where it gets a little interesting. Because normally, if both parties are equal in strength, both parties walk between the pieces together. But if one party is much weaker than the other, then the weaker party only will walk between the pieces because they're the ones most likely to break the covenant and therefore they need to make a solemn vow that they will not break the covenant. But this is where the story gets miraculous. Because in Genesis 15 and verse 12, it says, as the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. God was there. Verse 17, and when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, to your descendants, I give this land. God himself, in humility and vulnerability and liability of the covenant, as the weaker partner, walked between the pieces while Abraham was asleep. This will have consequences. Blood will be shed. Fleming Rutledge, the great theologian, said this, after the people of God have flagrantly disregarded their part in the covenant for thousands of years, God at last steps forward and on a hillside 
outside Jerusalem ratifies the covenant for once and for all in the blood of his son. Though we are faithless, God remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. This is what we remember every time we gather and take communion. It's not just a piece of bread or a piece of wine or a cup of wine. It is deeply symbolic of the faithfulness, the humility, and the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's all about blood. Matthew 26, 26, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Next time we celebrate communion together, just remember that God himself, while we were sleeping in our sin, walked between the pieces and took the sacrifice and the consequences and the liability on himself. This covenant of blood allows both fellowship with God and fellowship with each other. 1 John 1, 3, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, what I've just said, the message of Christ, the message of life, the message of communion. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we write this to make our joy complete. And then 1 John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. We are reconciled to God because of the blood covenant. We have fellowship with one another because of the blood covenant. One enables the other. This Community, and not just us in this room, but the community that we're part of, is a fellowship of blood. And if you want a title to the message, there it is. It is a fellowship of blood. And notice in this passage, it doesn't say that we've been purified, although we have. Notice it says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light and confess our sins, the blood of Jesus Christ purifies us from all sin. It's present tense as well as past tense. What God did is still outworking today in our midst. There is a past element and a present element and a future element as we see the fulfillment and the restoration. This is Kingdom now and kingdom not yet. God has done it and he is working it in us. When we gather in communion, it's not just a symbolic exercise. Something supernatural takes place. The covenant of blood is working on our behalf. It speaks. Did you know that blood speaks Hebrews 12, 22 says, you've come to Mount Zion. Look, can I just, before I read this, this isn't just coming to church on a Sunday morning. The reason that I'm giving you a background theology is because I want you to understand the enormity and the magnitude and the glory of what we're doing. We're not here because we haven't got anything better to do. We're not here because we like the songs. We're not here because the coffee's good. We've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. 
You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You've come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. When Cain killed his brother Abel, the Bible says his blood spoke out of the ground. It spoke and it demanded justice. It spoke guilty. It wanted justice. Every piece of innocent blood spilt on this earth demands justice. We can't do anything about it. We try and cleanse ourselves. We sacrifice bulls, but the blood of bulls say nothing until the blood of Christ comes and speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The blood of Abel says you're guilty. The blood of Christ says you are not guilty because of His glorious covenant. I call it the ABCs of the language of blood. The blood of Abel says guilty. The blood of bulls says nothing. The blood of Christ says not guilty. You need to understand that coming to church is not going to save you. Reading your Bible is not going to save you. You've got to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and allow His blood to cleanse you and forgive you. Not because you deserve it, not because I deserve it, not because we initiate it, because God in His majesty and glory initiated while we were sleeping in our sin, He walked between the pieces. He made an eternal covenant. I was at boarding school and uh, it was all boys. So whenever we had a play, a school play, I was always a woman. <laughs> when, uh, when I met Amanda, she went to an all-girls school. When she was in play, she was always a man. So we felt we were ripe for each other. But I was the waiting gentlewoman in Macbeth. Yes. And Lady Macbeth has just organized the murder of Macduff. And she looks at her hands and says, I still smell the smell of blood. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten these little hands. She could not remove her guilt. She could not remove her sin. And the waiting gentlewoman is on the side. I can't remember her lines, to be honest. But she's chatting to the doctor and she pleads with the doctor. She says, do something. Do something for the woman. She's covered in guilt. And the doctor says this. It's beyond my practice. We cannot remove guilt. We cannot remove sin. We cannot remove shame. Jesus is the one through the sprinkled blood and the eternal covenant who cleanses us forever. Let's have a look for a few minutes about the blood of the blood speaking on behalf, our behalf in relation to our fellowship with God. Firstly, I want to just, in fact, just a couple of things about this that you need to get into your spirit. This is the foundation of our relationship with God. This is our foundation with our health, our wholeness, and our holiness. Number one, the blood of Christ turns God's wrath away. Leviticus 17 and verse 11 says that it is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. It is the blood of Christ that turns God's wrath away. It's called, in theological terms, propitiation. 1 John 4.10, it is this love, uh, sorry, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation or the atoning sacrifice for His sins. We don't like thinking of God is angry. 
but he's so glorious, so holy, he cannot stand the presence of sin. And we're all sinners. But propitiation, according to John Stott, is the appeasement of the wrath of God by the love of God through the gift of God. The initiative is not taken by us, nor even by Christ, but by God himself in sheer unmerited love. The blood of Christ turns God's wrath away. But can I just say, there's a now and not yet. Though we, he is no longer angry because of Jesus, we still fear him. The Bible says we work at our salvation with fear and trembling. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12 and 13. We don't like talking about this, but when you understand the blood covenant, you understand. Do you remember what it said? A terrible darkness fell on Abraham. God was in the place. All right, number two, the blood of Christ redeems us from slavery. In him, Ephesians 1, 7, we have redemption through his blood. Revelation 1, 5, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. We were in slavery to our sin, in slavery to the world, the flesh, and the devil. We were dead in our sin, but God has bought us back. We've been redeemed from our slavery and set free and made to be the children of the living God. We are free. And yet we still fight. Don't, don't, just because God has made a covenant and he's taken the initiative and he has turned his wrath away and he's redeemed us from slavery, we still have an enemy. We still have to resist the enemy. We still have to crucify the flesh. We still have to separate ourselves from the world. Kingdom, but not yet. Thankfully, in the future, all will be restored and the enemy will be finally thrown down and we'll be completely and utterly free. But now it is a process. Number three, still with me? The blood of Christ declares us not guilty. Not guilty. Hebrews 9, 22. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed by blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. People go through tragedies. Maybe someone recklessly, drunkenly drives their car and kills their child. And they say, I cannot and I will not ever forgive them. But Jesus said, Love your enemies. How can we possibly do that? Because without the shedding of blood, there is no possibility of forgiveness. But we have had a covenant made. Romans 5, 9. Since we have now been justified by his blood. Justified by his blood means declared not guilty. This is a legal term. You're not guilty. And once you've been declared not guilty by sheer unmerited love and a blood covenant made thousands of years ago, once we've got it, forgiveness is the obvious thing. I've been forgiven. I must forgive. Number four, and finally, under the fellowship with God, the blood of Christ makes us holy. This is the language of the temple Hebrews 13, 11, the high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burnt outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate and made the people holy through his own blood. There are over 400 references to blood in the Bible. You better get used to it, guys. Jesus has made you right with God, holy, so that you can have confidence to walk into the holy place. Because if it wasn't for the blood of Christ, you'd be burnt to a crisp in a second. 
But thankfully, we've been made right. And we are holy. And we can walk in, not with our hands in our pocket, with that sort of misunderstanding of what God has done for us, as though God is our bestie. No, he is the God of the universe, the creator and all his majesty and glory. How dare we come into his presence with anything except the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin. But is this finished? No, it isn't finished. Uh, Hebrews 10, 14, for by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made perfect. Holy. The process hasn't finished. He's made you holy, but he's still working on you. The blood is purifying us, making us holy as we gather. Are you getting the idea here? I could go on another 15 things that the covenant has done, but we're running out of time. So let's have a look at the fellowship with each other. Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching that's what I'm just, just teaching you. And to fellowship. That word is koinonia. Mutually sharing. Sharing in common with. Contribution. Participation. That's the word. Koinonia. Notice, fellowship with each other follows fellowship with God. In other words, now that you've got fellowship with God by the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus enables us to have fellowship with each other. This is a fellowship of blood. 1 John 1, 3, we proclaim to you, as I've said, what we've seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. This is not just a social club. This is something much bigger. People talk about the church dying. Have they any idea what started it? Have they any idea who's going to finish it? Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. <laughs> Rumours of our death have been grossly exaggerated. The church is alive and well and always will be because of what Jesus did on the cross. Are you getting the idea? All right, a couple of things about you, the fellowship of blood that you need to grasp. Number one, we are a faith community. As I said, we're not a social club. We're not here because you get pizzas after the Sunday night service. We're not here. We're nothing to do with the clubs down the road, the football club or the RSL. Thank God for the communities, but we're different, totally and absolutely different. We are a community of faith. We're a fellowship of blood. Look at what it says, Romans 5, 3, 25. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. See, when you're talking to your neighbours and you say you're going to go to church, if you use some of these phrases, they'd think, who are you? But we've got to understand who we really are. We're a community of faith. The world will never understand it. They never can understand. They don't understand why we gather at all. We're not just valuable to the community because we serve them. We're valuable to the community because we are a community of faith in an unbelieving and dark and broken world. And we need to stand up for what we are, a fellowship of blood. Number two, we are a witnessing community. We're a witnessing community. We testify about the blood of Jesus. I love this verse, Rem, Rem, Revelation 12, 10. When I gave this to Sebastian, he said, oh, there's a lot of scripture here because he's got to put them all up on the screen. Sorry, Sebastian. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down and they triumphed over him 
by their degrees, by their church attendance, by their faithful Bible reading, by their giving. Oh, sorry, I misquoted verse 11. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Your testimony is not saying, I became a Christian at two o'clock in the morning on the 14th of March, 1974. No, your testimony is what you believe about the blood of Christ and what is accomplished on your behalf. Satan is gonna accuse you day and night and he's not impressed by your church attendance. But when you mention Jesus and the covenant of blood, that'll, that'll send him away. We are, say it with me, we are a faith community. We're a witnessing community. We're a forgiving community. I've already read it. 1 John 1, 7, we have fellowship and the blood of Christ cleanses us. It goes on to say, verse nine, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This is a community of unity. This is a community where we're in this together. We've been reconciled to God, so we must reconcile with each other. This is no place for grudges. This is no place for unforgiveness. We are here to forgive and be forgiven. Desmond Tutu said this, a whole world can be built on the very foundation laid out in these three simple words. I am sorry. What is important is that we are courageous enough to say them, vulnerable enough to mean them, and humble enough to repeat them as many times as necessary. I've said it before, but I'm gonna say it again. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if over the 33 years that I've served in this community, I've hurt you. I'm sorry if I've let you down. I'm sorry if I've been unfaithful in any way. I am really sorry if you've been hurt in this season over the last three or four years. As a member of the church and as one of the leaders, I am sorry. And the reason I can say it is because I've been forgiven. And I'm a broken and flawed individually. <laughs> individual. And God found me asleep at my post, but I had the humility and the grace to walk between the pieces and forgive me. And because I am forgiven, I am happy to say sorry and happy to forgive anybody who's hurt me. And number four, and finally, we are a covenant community. What uh, Fleming Rutledge calls a Eucharistic community. 1 Corinthians 10, 7, 16. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation, that's the word koinonia, a fellowship in the blood of Christ. And is not the bread that we break, the bread that we break, a participation, a fellowship in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are one many, sorry, we who are many are one body, for we all share one loaf. Remember, a Eucharistic community, taken from the Greek word thanksgiving. We share communion, a Eucharist, a thanksgiving together. This is the very heartbeat of our faith. So, how are we gonna do all of this? I'm gonna read one scripture and this is a blessing. In fact, I'd like everybody to stand. If you're in Shanghai or in a West or online, why don't you stand with us? And I'm just gonna read this scripture over you. Have you received the word today? You got the idea? It's all about blood. All right. I want you to receive this as a blessing. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. Now, may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep. May he equip you 
with everything good for doing his will. And listen to this. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Could you just put your hands in the air? Father God, I thank you for these wonderful people. I pray that the deep solemnity and miraculous nature of the blood covenant will get into our spirits. And may we genuinely be not just a club, but a fellowship of blood. We ask it in the precious and the most wonderful name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. 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 I'm just going to quickly ask you about your personal faith. Whether you're online or in the other campuses or here at Hills, can I just ask you? Not whether you go to church, clearly you do. Or whether you read the Bible, sometimes I'm sure you do. But do you know that Jesus Christ has come into your life, forgiven you, and changed you? Do you have a real, personal, current relationship with Jesus because if you don't I would love to include you in a simple prayer this is where you accept what Jesus has done for you you and I are sinners we deserved to die for our sin but Jesus died in our place his blood was shed because without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness but because of it we can receive forgiveness and transformation. Not only be reconciled to God, but be reconciled to a community of believers that is more than a club. So if you're in this auditorium and you want to give your life to Jesus for the first time or give your life to Jesus for the first time in a long time because you've walked away, or if you're online or any of the other campuses, I'd love you to respond. Could everybody just close your eyes? I'm going to count to three when I get to three. If you're in this auditorium, you want Jesus to come into your life. Or if you're online in one of the other canvases, you do this as well. When I get to three, just put your hand in the air as a sign that you want Jesus Christ to make himself real to you. And you want to make him Lord of your life. Okay? One, two, three. Slip your hand up. Slip your hand up and wave it so I can see it. Thank you. Just wave it around if you're not sure that you're right with God. Hands going up. I love that. Thank you. Anyone else? So good. All right. I'm sure other people in other campuses have done the same. So we're all going to pray this prayer together. Say with me. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ. Today, I realize what you've done for me. So I give my life to you. And make you my Lord and King. Please forgive me as you said you would. Change me. Do what I cannot do. From today, with your help, I'll live differently for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give these people a clap. I'm sure Jay's going to come up and talk to you, but if you just put your hand in the air, online, obviously, you can get uh, just say on the line, online, that you've made a decision. But if you just made a decision, either in those campuses or in this one, tell someone. Tell the person next to you. I prayed that prayer. And then in the fire afterwards, walk out. Someone's going to be holding up a Bible. It's a Bible for you that tells you what Jesus has done for you and what you can do for Jesus. And it'll change your life. God bless you. God bless you.